Marcel Grossman was the ideal student. Born in 1878 in Budapest, Hungary, to Jules and Katharina, Marcel had worked his way through the educational system of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. His father had been from Switzerland before moving to Budapest to found an agricultural machinery factory, and when Marcel turned 15, the family moved back there to settle in Basel. Finishing his schooling in the Swiss system, Marcel then enrolled at the Zurich Polytechnic to study mathematics with the intention of becoming a gymnasium teacher. Diligent, punctual, and meticulous, he was every professor's dream. It was surprising then that he fell in with one of his classmates, the less than diligent young Swabian Albert Einstein. Unlike Grossman, Einstein often skipped class, didn't bother taking notes, and often bucked the system. But, as Grossman soon realized, he was brilliant. Ideas that eluded Marcel came quickly to Albert, who could then explain them to his friend in ways that were more understandable. And so in return, the mathematician was happy to lend his notes to his more bohemian friend, a kindness Albert would set later say saved him when it came to studying for his final exams during his junior year, when his romantic attachments had made him even less likely to attend class. As that junior year had begun, the two men had been joined by a somewhat older woman, Maleva. She was a fellow student in their program and was dark and intense, but it caught Albert's eye, and before Grossman and Albert graduated, the two were a couple. Not exactly the way Marcel would have done things, but he well understood that his friend didn't usually do things the way they were usually done. While Einstein was focused on physics and avoid mathematics, except when he had to, Marcel found the formal structure of mathematical deduction to his liking, especially in the area of geometry. Soon, he was focusing not on just Euclidean geometry that captivated his friends so completely, but instead on geometries of projections and curved surfaces. It would become his life's work, and in time, he would once again come to his friend's rescue when most needed. Michel Besso, on the other hand, was something altogether different from Grossman. He had been born in Zurich and had been raised there, but had moved to Italy with his family. His father and uncles were engineers working in the field of electrical power generation and distribution, and he had planned to follow in their footsteps. A brilliant student, he first attended university in Rome before moving back to Zurich, eventually attending the Polytechnic there where he earned his degree in engineering. In many ways, he was the exact opposite of Grossman. Brilliant, but terminally unorganized. He had met Einstein a year earlier through a mutual acquaintance and a musical event and, as the two got to know each other, found that they had ties through their families back to the electrical industry in Italy. Their first conversation had been about competing theories regarding the nature of light put forth by Newton and Huygens, and, in a true meeting of the mind, the two soon became lifelong friends. Though Besso was five years older than Einstein and had graduated the year before the younger man would enroll at the Polytechnic, the two stayed in touch and would eventually spend a good bit of time together, first in Zurich, then in Milan, and then finally later in Bern. Besso would become in Einstein's intellectual sounding board, the creative mirror off which he could reflect his ideas. Over time, these two men would have their lives intersect with that of Einstein's, and in each case, they would make important contributions to his work. All three, coming from similar backgrounds, would follow different but intertwining paths that would, in time, alter the world. They shared the same basic assumptions and experiences, and so their friendships would survive the tumultuous period of stormy relationships, world wars, and Einstein's eventual fame. And yet, during this period of Einstein's development, each would take a backseat to the dark-haired woman who was, in the words of Walter Isaacson, quote, Einstein's muse, partner, lover, wife, bet noir, and antagonist. She would create an emotional field more powerful than that of anyone else in his life. <laughs>
It would alternately attract and repulse him with a force so strong that a mere scientist like himself would never be able to fathom it. They were kindred spirits who perceived themselves as aloof scholars and outsiders. Slightly rebellious towards bourgeois expectations, they were both intellectuals who sought as a lover someone who would be a partner, colleague, and collaborator. End quote. In this, Maleva March was, for a time, more than either Grossman or Besso could ever be, but also less. For even if she had his heart, at least for a while, she was a woman who would never find a permanent place in Einstein's inner world. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. <laughs> The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 50.2, Supplemental. Albert Einstein, the Bourgeois Bohemian. Part 1 When Albert Einstein showed up at his family's residence in Italy at the end of the fall term of 1895, he was at least wise enough to realize that the awkward conversation about what was he doing and how on earth did he expect to have a future without even a high school diploma, much less a college degree, conversation would go a whole lot better if he had a plan. And so he made sure that he did. First, he did actually have a better excuse than, for leaving Munich than either the blatantly transparent nervous exhaustion fiction that allowed, had allowed everyone to walk away from what was an obviously deteriorating situation, or the I sure do miss you all so very much sort of thing children will sometimes tell their parents. Instead, he reminded them that if he remained in Bavaria, he would be required to enlist in the military, something neither he nor his parents really wanted. Instead, he asked his father to help him to arrange a renunciation of his citizenship so as to avoid that issue and thus remain in Italy. Second, he showed his parents the letter from his mathematics teacher at Lutpold that recommended that given his excellent marks in science and mathematics, he be allowed to leave the gymnasium. His argument was that if the school there felt that there was really nothing left to teach him, wasn't that really an indication of that it was time for him to go to university. All he needed was to find a way to stand for the entrance exam at the technical university in Zurich, Switzerland, known as the Zurich Polytechnique, and he would be set to go. He told his parents that he planned to spend the spring and summer studying for the exam while also helping out at the electrical company, and when he passed the exam, as he was almost certain to do, he would enroll at the Polytechnique I'll basically in allowing him to skip the last two years of gymnasium and go straight into engineering. Mollified by its forethought and his willingness to continue to work to make something of himself, Albert's parents relented and took him in, no doubt happy to have the family back together again. For his part, his father Herman upheld his end of the deal, helping his son renounce his citizenship and become a man without a country in 1896. Albert, on the other hand, was a bit more mixed in his meeting the terms of the agreement. He did immediately go to work for his father and uncle and began contributing by once again helping solve various problems related to the physics and mathematics of the enterprise. However, when it came to studying for the exams, he was less than diligent in going through the rigorous set of exercises and drills designed to help him be able to pass those exams, which tested knowledge far more than ability. To be fair, he did buy a three-volume textbook on advanced physics written by the well-known physicist of the time, Jules Vollier, 
And in the margins of the books, he filled it, he filled them with his notes from that time. Unfortunately, however, when it came time to study things that were more boring, at least to him, things like botany, French, or politics, he found that he would rather go hiking in the Italian Alps or the Apennines. One such expedition took him from the family's apartment in Pavia to his maternal uncle's home in Genoa. As he made these journeys, he was delighted to experience, for the first time, interactions with non-Germanic peoples. In his letters to his sister, Einstein commented on their natural grace and delicately as contrasted with the, quote, spiritually broken and mechanically obedient automatons, quote, end quote, of Germany. It wouldn't take an advanced degree in psychology to recognize that Einstein harbored a deep bitterness on account of what had occurred at the gymnasium. The other thing he did in this sort of interim period is that he actually wrote his first, if you want to call it this, scientific paper, an essay in theoretical physics titled On the Investigation of the State of the Ether in a Magnetic Field. The paper was sort of a distilling of Voyer's writings on the topics of electric and magnetic fields along with his extensions to that built on the experiences he was having in his electrical shop. As a bit of background here, the ether was an idea that had been around since the time of Huygens, but that had gained significant currency after Young's experiments in 1801 had shown that light was in fact a wave. While there were different models, a few of them anyway, that tried to explain what the ether was, the most common of these suggested that it was sort of a very rigid electromagnetic fluid that was both invisible and unresistive to the passage of matter, something that seems really strange to us now, if only because Einstein's work in 1905 would banish the idea to the trash bin of discarded scientific theories. The discussion about the nature of the ether had been supercharged, if you'll pardon the pun, after Maxwell's publication of the equations that unified the electric and magnetic phenomena into one single electromagnetic interaction that generated waves that moved at the speed very nearly to that which was observed for light. Einstein's paper suggested a variety of experiments that might shed light on the elastic nature of the ether by looking at the, quote, magnetic field formed around an electric current, end quote. It really was an interesting bit of work by a 16-year-old boy, not terribly original, but indicative that he was taking the ideas in the published literature and making them his own by trying to extend them into new territory. The most practical upshot of all of this is that he sent the paper to another one of his uncles, Caesar Cook, the one that had bought him the steam engine to play with when he had been a little boy in Munich. Cook was a well-connected merchant in Belgium and had a fondness for Albert's intellectual precociousness. While downplaying the paper, Einstein mentioned that he had hoped to attend the Zurich Polytechnic in the fall, but was worried that the school would say that he was too young to stand for the entrance exam. As is so often the case, Cook used his influence to find a friend who knew the right people and have them look over the paper. Suitably impressed with the boy's work, the friend wrote to the director of the school to ask for the exemption from the age requirement to take the test. While the director was skeptical, writing in his response that he wasn't sure about admitting this quote-unquote so-called child prodigy, even if he did pass the exam, he waived the requirement so that Albert could give it a shot. So it was that in October of 1895, Albert boarded a train bound for Zurich, having spent a lot of time studying physics and not much time studying anything else. As such, when he went to Zurich and took the exam, he found that he was not nearly as ready as he had thought. As might be expected, he exceeded the entrance requirements in his favorite subjects, but was found deficient in areas related to the humanities, apart from music, that is, most especially languages. Nevertheless, the Polytechnic's physics chair, Heinrich Weber, suggested that Einstein study for the exams once again and in the meantime sit in on his second year physics seminar. While an enticing offer, Albert decided to go in another direction, one suggested by that same skeptical director that had waived the requirements for him. Instead of having this young man at loose ends in Zurich, why not enroll for a year in one of the preparatory schools nearby and work on those other subjects in a more formal fashion. Perhaps familiar with Einstein's story from Munich, 
He suggested that the boy look into a cantonal school in the town of Eral, some 25 miles to the west of Zurich, that had a more liberal approach to education. This decision would be one that would have profound consequences for his outlook on life. It would also be where he would meet his second family and his first love. The school in Aral, Switzerland, was formerly known as the Argovian Cantonal School, which basically meant that it was the official high school of that province in northern Switzerland. What made the school notable, at least in the eyes of Einstein, was that its curriculum and instructional methods followed the educational philosophy of a Swiss educational reformer by the name of Johann Heinrich Pestalozzi. An ardent student of the Enlightenment and its ideals, Pestalozzi had founded a number of schools, both in the German and French-speaking portions of Switzerland, based on his model of, quote, learning by the head, hands, and heart, end quote. Additionally, he recognized that it was important to understand that each student was an individual whose inner dignity, as he put it, should be nurtured and allowed to flourish. This was to be accomplished through a curriculum centered on the student's own learning experience that began with hands-on observation, then proceeded to drawing out the student's intuition to frame those observations through developing conceptual models and visualizing how things worked. In his words, quote, Visual understanding is the essential and only true means of teaching how to judge things correctly. The learning of numbers and language must be definitely subordinated. As you might imagine, this approach, so different than the more regimented system used in the German Gymnasia, was a balm to Einstein's spirit. He embraced the method and found that his rebelliousness towards authority melted away completely. He would write, quote, when compared to six years schooling at the German authoritarian gymnasium, it made me clearly realize how much superior an education based on free action and personal responsibility is to one relying on outward authority." End quote. His sister, who would also attend the school due to her brother's experience, would say, quote, "...pupils were treated individually. More emphasis was placed on independent thought than on punditry." And young people saw the teacher not as a figure of authority, but alongside the student, a man of distinct personality. End quote. As such, there were two very tangible results of Einstein's year in Arua. The first was that he began to learn the art of the Gedanken experiment, or translated into English, the thought experiment. We've talked about this in some of our other episodes, most notably those on the Bohr-Einstein debates, but let me say just a few words about them here. The thought experiment is something where a person considers a situation in terms of its most basic or fundamental elements without the constraints that might be imposed by reality. This might be thinking of political systems where every person has a vote, an economic market wherein all the actors have immediate and full access to all of the information, or, in the case of Einstein during this time, what it might be like to travel along a beam of light, an idea it is said that he had while riding a bicycle one morning during his time at the school. Once the system is proposed, whatever it might be, the thinker then considers, often initially through visualization, how the system might behave in certain conditions or if certain parameters are changed. This allows one to strip away much of the extraneous information and focus in on one or two really important pieces in such a way that insight on how to proceed with an investigation might occur. While Einstein certainly wouldn't master the technique at Erau, he would for the first time come to realize how powerful a tool it was for thinking about physics, and as mentioned, he would begin to consider light in all of its interesting and glorious detail. In his words, quote, In a row, I made my first rather childish experiments in thinking that had a direct bearing on the special theory. If a person could run after a light wave with the same speed as light, you would have a wave arrangement which could be completely independent of time. Of course, such a thing is impossible. End quote. The other major influence on his development during this time was the Winteler family. <laughs> 
As was common in situations wherein a student would come to a school from a family that did not live in the region, Einstein boarded with a member of the institution's faculty. In this case, a teacher of literature by the name of Jost Wintler. Wintler was a liberal instructor at the Cantonal School who, like Einstein, deplored what he saw as the corrosive effects of both the rise of unrestrained nationalism and the militarization of culture that accompanied it. He was both edgy in a sense and brutally honest in his assessments of the path the European powers had placed themselves on and was profoundly idealistic in his beliefs that there was a need to promote political reform in Europe along the lines of federalism and internationalism. Ideas strikingly similar to what was, at that very time, being promoted at the Manchester Conference of the Society of Friends in England that would have such a profound impact in shaping the ideas of a young Arthur Eddington. As was the case there, Einstein's views on politics and education, while already along the lines of Wintler's, would be profoundly influenced by his time with the family. As Walter Isaacson writes, quote, Like his mentor, Einstein would become a supporter of world federalism, internationalism, pacifism, and democratic socialism, with a strong devotion to individual liberty and freedom of expression, end quote. The Einstein of later years, after his immigration to the United States at Princeton, with his statements in favor of pursuing peace and international co cooperation, was formed here in the Wintler household. And Einstein really did find a second home there. Soon, he was referring to Joost as Papa and the matron of the house, Rosa, as Mama. They treated Albert as a son, and soon, between meals shared around the dinner table and social engagements that often involved Albert playing his violin, the young man shed some of his heart and shell and began to open up emotionally. Here he saw something different than the typical bourgeois German ethos, a humanism enacted on a familial scale that closely matched the environment of the larger educational community that valued inquiry. Given this, it is not too surprising that, for the first time in his life, Einstein found himself in love. The Wintler's oldest daughter, Marie, had recently graduated from a teaching college and had moved back home prior to taking a position at a school in a nearby village. She was a few years older than Albert and of a very different mindset than he. The match was something that both families approved of, and one can see from the correspondence between them during this time that they both expected the relationship to grow into something much more permanent. During the year in Aru, Einstein would display his typical patterns of achievement in school. In math and physics, he would excel, but in other subjects, he was uh, less proficient. When Wintler sent a report back to Einstein's father explaining the son's progress or lack thereof, Herman penned the response, quote, Not all of its parts fulfill my wishes and expectations, but with Albert, I got used to finding mediocre grades along with very good ones, and I am therefore not disconsolate about them, end quote. Throughout the year, Albert would require extra tutoring in French and, somewhat surprisingly, in chemistry. As 1895 turned into 1896, he would also, with the help of his father, complete the process of renouncing his German citizenship at the cost of three German marks. At that same time, he officially forsook the Jer Jewish faith that had once so powerfully captivated him. This, however, was merely a step in what would prove to be an ever-evolving relationship with spiritual matters and a sense of Jewish identity. At the end of the academic year, Einstein took his final exams and finished second in his class, earning fives and sixes in, out of six in all of his subjects except French, where he earned only a three. This qualified him to once again sit for the entrance exams at Zurich Polytechnic. This time, he did much better, though his French essay was poor, and was admitted as a student in what would today be thought of as a physics degree with an emphasis in education. In a sense, the program was designed to prepare men to teach the subjects of physics and mathematics in the cantonal and gymnasium schools throughout Switzerland and Germany. At the end of the summer of 1896, Einstein packed his bags and returned to Zurich with the hope of becoming a theoretical physicist, something of a surprise to his engineering-trained father and uncle.
When Einstein had left Munich at the end of 1894 to escape what he saw as an oppressive environment, not just at the Lutpolt Gymnasium, but throughout the German Reich, I think it's fair to say that he saw his path being similar to that of his uncle, Jacob. He would attend a technical school, earn a degree in engineering, and then join his father and uncle in the family business of providing electrical power and lighting to various businesses and municipalities in northern Italy. His actions in that spring and summer of 1895 are entirely consistent with the still common at the time practice, as with the father, so too with the son. However, as the plan changed with Einstein's failure to gain admission to the Zurich Polytechnique and enrollment in the Cantonal School at Erau, well, the plan changed. While I haven't been able to find any sources that explicitly say this, I think that there are probably two factors in why, in 1896, he didn't follow his original set of ideas. The first very likely had to do with the environment at the school and in the Wintler's home. For the first time in his life, he saw something different. Knowledge and learning were valued not because of the careers or luxuries that it could produce, but rather because it was inherently valuable and worthwhile. Moreover, individuals of learning, men like Jost Wintler and the other teachers at the school, were respected and had dignity simply because they engaged in an intellectual life. They were valued as educators who changed the lives of those they taught. For a young and impressionable youth, whose whole worldview was coming into shape in that environment, the idea of spending one's life building things that would both enslave some while also creating additionally, additional luxury for those of great wealth had to give pause. He would write to a friend later in his life, quote, I was originally supposed to become an engineer, but the thought of having to expend my creative energy on things that make practical everyday life even more refined, with a bleak capital gain as the goal, was unbearable to me, thinking for its own stake, like music." End quote. The other thing that I think really made Einstein question the path he had once accepted so readily was that in the summer of 1896, his father and uncle's business once again failed. For the second time in three years, the complex world of public works, finance, and engineering had proved to be too much for the pair. While Jacob would take the hint, as it were, and join another firm as a staff engineer, Herman Einstein would make another go of trying to do things on his own, with financing from his wife's side of the family. Albert wrote to relatives, hoping that they would not once again invest in his father, but they would put up the money to get him going again. For young Albert, so suspicious of what he saw as the dull and uncritical life of the bourgeois, becoming an engineer likely represented a path that would certainly lead to a similar fate. So it was that when it came time to enroll at Zurich Polytechnique, a school he had originally picked, at least probably, on account of its strong engineering program in a German-speaking region that wasn't German, he chose a program that would likely take him in the direction of his teachers at the Eru School. In one of the many ironies that would populate Einstein's life, his bills were paid by the same wealthy bourgeois relatives that were fronting the money to get his father back on his feet. When he arrived in the fall of 1896 at the age of 17, Einstein was a very different person than the one that had left Munich two years earlier. To begin with, he had grown up. There are two descriptions from this time, roughly, that describe him, and they're very much at odds with the common picture that most of us probably have of the grandfatherly figure who can be seen in pictures riding a bicycle, or the imp who occasionally stuck his tongue out at a photographer taking his picture. Instead, in the words of one woman who knew him during that time, he possessed, quote, masculine good looks of the type that played havoc at the turn of the century, end quote. His classmate, Hans Byland wrote a revealing description of him, calling him the impudent Swabian. Quote, sure of himself, his gray felt hat pushed back on his thick black hair, he strode energetically up and down in the rapid, I might say crazy, tempo of a restless spirit which carries a whole world in itself. Nothing escaped the sharp gaze of the large, bright brown eyes. Whoever approached him was captivated by his superior personality. A mocking curl of his fleshy mouth with his protruding lower lip did not encourage Philistines to fraternize with him. End quote. 
Additionally, Byland also said, quote, he confronted the world spirit as a laughing philosopher, and his witty sarcasm mercilessly castigated all vanity and artificiality, end quote. In the pictures of him from this time, he has dark, thick, wavy hair. He has smoldering eyes, a high forehead, and in the words of many of those who commented on his looks during his college years, a sensuous mouth. Referring to this last attribute, the woman who commented on his good looks also said, quote, The lower half of his face might have belonged to a sensualist who found plenty of reasons to love life. End quote. To riff on the title of our last episode, Einstein was indeed a fine young Swabian and would show himself to be something of a player as time went on, a far cry from the popular image of the man that would one day develop. In the year of his enrollment as a freshman at the Polytechnique, he joined 840 or so other students who came to be educated mostly in technical and teaching professions with the goal of earning a baccalaureate degree. The Polytechnique wouldn't begin awarding PhDs, at least technically, until 1911. It wasn't as prestigious a school as the University of Zurich or the University of Geneva, but it was a good, solid institution whose graduates could expect a fine education by a surprisingly good faculty. Einstein's program had 11 total first-year enrollees, 10 men, and surprisingly, a single woman, Maleva Marich, of whom we shall have much to say shortly. The department chair was the somewhat renowned physicist Heinrich Weber, whose work in magnetism earned him the honor of having the unit of magnetic flux named for him. He had wisely used this reputation to convince Werner von Siemens, Einstein's father's one-time competitor in Munich, to build a new state-of-the-art physics building on the campus. So it was that Einstein was able to have access to what initially seemed like an ideal educational setting. His first two years at the school went pretty well, and he got along with Weber, whose lectures he praised in letters to others. Weber's lectures were well-organized, engaging, and fruitful. Quote, Weber lectured on heat with great mastery. One lecture after another of his pleases me, end quote, would be Einstein's comments. Additionally, he worked in Weber's lab with fervor and passion, and it is likely that his experience in the workshops of his father and uncle served him well in this capacity. However, this experience may also have planted the seeds for the eventual souring of the relationship between the two. Once Einstein got into the advanced courses of the physics curriculum, he began to feel as if Faber wasn't giving enough attention to the most recent advances in the various fields of research, most notably in the areas of electric and magnetic phenomena. This was likely due to his already having encountered these ideas in his time of independent study and then the applications that he made at the engineering firm. As such, he soon lost respect for Weber and the common relationship set up where Einstein began to violate the cultural norms designed to signify the proper relationships between the student and the professor, at least in German-dominated areas of the time. As one example of this, instead of addressing Weber as Herr Professor, as would have been most proper, he instead took to calling him Herr Weber. Not exactly wrong, but certainly less respectful than the situation called for. Eventually, Weber's frustration with Einstein led him to say, in an echo of the faculty member in Munich, quote, You're a very clever boy, Einstein, an extremely clever boy, but you have one great fault. You'll never let yourself be told anything. End quote. Additionally, Einstein had gotten on the wrong side of the department's other physicist, Jean Bernay. Bernay had taught many of the lab courses at the school and found that Einstein was very much the independent spirit in the lab. As is still the case in many places, Bernay had the practice of writing up a procedure that the student was expected to follow in order to arrive at a particular set of results that would illustrate a certain physical idea or concept being taught in the corresponding lecture course. The idea was that the student was generally in need of both an introduction into how to use the required equipment and how that equipment would produce the data that would prove the validity of a given physical principle, equation, or mathematical model. Einstein, though, had no use for Bernays sheets. 
his experience in the family workshops, and the more free-form methods of instruction he'd experienced at Aral led him to take the sheet and, almost immediately, throw it in the wastebasket at the beginning of class, and then set out on his own course of investigation. This infuriated Pernay, who asked an assistant, quote, What if you make of Einstein? He always does something different from what I have ordered, end quote. To this, the younger and probably somewhat more open-minded assistant replied, quote, He does indeed, Herr Professor, but his solutions are right, and the methods he uses are of great interest, end quote. This, of course, would eventually catch up to Einstein, who, in 1899, would cause an explosion in the lab that would injure his right hand and force him to stop playing his violin for some time. The other area of Einstein's education where we should make some comments relate to his mathematical training. As Einstein himself would later say, quote, It was not clear to me as a student that a more profound knowledge of the basic principles of physics was tied up with the most intricate mathematical methods, end quote. Therefore, he tended to not put much effort into his math classes that were required in the curriculum, earning the equivalent of C's in most of the courses. Moreover, he tended to avoid other, more difficult classes to the point that the professor of mathematics at the school, Hermann Minkowski, would refer to him as a lazy dog. Again, the irony here is that it would be Minkowski who would put Einstein's special theory on a more solid mathematical foundation two years after it was published, a development Einstein would lament at first, but would eventually come to appreciate. All in all, it is fair to say that Einstein was a brilliant but significantly underachieving student at Zurich. He was able to excel in those classes he found interesting, but he tended to blow off those he found less useful, often going into some sort of a process of self-study. He skipped classes that he didn't enjoy, took atrocious notes, and generally held those he saw as not being cutting edge enough in some contempt. He was, for lack of a better term, kind of an undergraduate punk. A brilliant undergraduate punk, but a punk nonetheless. Of course, that's not the term he would have used. He tended to call himself a bohemian in correspondence, and it should be said that his criticisms of Weber and Pernay were not completely unfounded. As Isaacson writes, the way things developed at Zurich was, quote, yet another example of how Einstein's scientific as well as personal life was affected by the traits deeply bred into his Swabian soul. His casual willingness to question authority, his sassy attitude in the, se in the face of regimentation, and his lack of reverence for received wisdom, end quote. To put it in contemporary terms, today, Someone like Einstein would probably be a brilliant, well-read, handsome hipster millennial with a plethora of tattoos, a few piercings, and some creatively groomed facial hair who drank his PBR ironically, though actually Einstein never really drank, while calling out his regional college professors for not being up on the latest doings of Elon Musk or the most recent results from either CERN or LIGO. He'd have a couple of bad grades on his transcript, along with a lot of really good ones in a few specialized topics. He'd ace the finals in his classes, outscoring all of the other students by leaps and bounds with a certain arrogance, but then he'd turn in projects that were only half done after trying to do things that were either poorly conceived or impractical. He would complete his program of study, but it would be almost in spite of whatever academic advising he'd received, rather than because of it and he'd likely have been pulled into the dean's office on more than one occasion for a bit of a talking to about proper decorum and the taking of the school thing a bit more seriously. Which, by the way, happened to Einstein. I have to say, having been a professor for now 23 years, I've run across this kind of student from time to time, and I can tell you that I have more than just a bit of sympathy for Hare, Professors Weber, Pernay, and Minkowski. Though I have to say, I hope that I handled things in a less regimented and more flexible fashion than they did. I would like to think that I've given those sorts of students enough space to be themselves and find their paths through the really excellent curriculum the physics education research community has developed and I've only been smart or wise enough to adopt over the standard methods of plug and chug learning without compromising the academic integrity of the learning environment. Of course, such judgments can only be made by my former and present students who might have similarly harsh assessments of my abilities 
as Einstein did his professors. To be honest, I really have to wonder what might have been the case had Einstein had the opportunity to attend a school more like what he'd experienced in Aral. Would he have arrived at his breakthroughs earlier? Or was the exclusion from the mainstream something that was necessary in order for him to seek out and find the various ideas that would eventually propel him to those great discoveries and to fame? At this point, we need to turn to Einstein's personal life during this time in Zurich and engage in that other great theme from this time, his relationship with Maleva March. While I'd like to save the more general comments regarding Einstein's romantic life and his relationships with women to a later episode, as I think they'll make more sense there, we need to spend a little bit of time understanding this relationship in some detail in order to more fully appreciate what would occur in Zurich over the years between 1896 and 1907, things that we'll cover both in this and our next episode. When Albert had arrived in Zurich, he was still in that relationship with Marie Winsler, a relationship that had been forged in the straightforward, honest household in Aral. Marie had now taken her teaching position at what would might be an elementary school in that nearby village, and Einstein had moved to the big city, and soon the relationship began to suffer from the sorts of things many long-distance relationships deal with. Two people in different environments going in different directions. Had Einstein stayed in the Winsler household with Jost as his mentor and guide, perhaps things might have gone differently. But now, out on his own, living what he saw as a bohemian lifestyle, he began to drift away from his first sweetheart. While she was settling into a view of their relationship that was likely profoundly domestic, especially as she was surrounded by a lot of cute, small children, and still doing his laundry, sent by post of course, he had entered a vibrantly intellectual culture filled with ideas and music. Before long, he wrote suggesting that they no longer write each other, indicating that he was ready to move on. Marie, however, was not willing to let the relationship go, and she would write back scolding him for being grumpy. His letters grew increasingly cruel towards her until, unable to get her to see that he was no longer willing to continue, he stopped writing entirely. The collapse of what Marie must have seen as her future sent her into an emotional tailspin from which it would take her a long time to recover. In a revealing letter to Rosla Wintler, Marie's mother, in which he told his mama that he wouldn't be visiting over the spring break and then declared the relationship over, Einstein wrote revealingly of what would be his method of dealing with emotional setbacks and personal troubles, the retreat into scientific contemplation. Quote, It would be more than unworthy of me to buy a few days of bliss at the cost of new pain, of which I have already caused too much to the dear child through my fault. It fills me with a peculiar kind of satisfaction that I now myself have to taste some of the pain that I brought upon the dear girl through my thoughtlessness and ignorance of her delicate nature. Strenuous intellectual work and looking at God's nature are the reconciling, fortifying, yet relentlessly strict angels that shall lead me through all of life's troubles. If only I were able to give some of this to the good child. And yet, what a peculiar way this is to weather the storms of life. In many a lucid moment, I appear to myself as an ostrich who buries his head in the desert sand so as to not perceive the danger. One creates a little world for oneself, as lamentably insignificant as it may be in comparison with the perpetually changing size of real existence. End quote. Before we leave this episode in Einstein's life, I would make a comment about the various opinions of Einstein's biographers about what it all says regarding his treatment and view of women. For some, this is little more than what might be seen as a first high school romance between two young peoples, teenagers actually, filled with infatuation and grand promises, but that doesn't really take into account the very real differences in the personalities of the smitten. In this view, 
what we're really seeing is more or less a case of Marie and Albert being in love with love and letting that carry them forward far too quickly. In other words, it's more or less a common tale of first love. Anyone who remembers back to their first love or who interacts with teenagers on a regular basis will certainly recognize the story. Others, however, see in Einstein's cruelty and response the first signs of a pattern that would be the hallmark of all of his relationships going forward. His self-centeredness, his callous regard for the feelings of others, or I should say callous disregard for the feeling of others, his inability to deal with his partner in a forthright manner, his willingness to move on so quickly, and his ability to wall himself off emotionally can all be seen to one degree or another in this short time he was involved with Marie. The claim is made that Einstein saw women as vehicles to meet his needs, whether they be emotional, physical, or domestic, and he showed no indication that he felt that he had the responsibility or needed to reciprocate in any way once the relationship was perceived to have stopped doing those things. This was, in, the, in this kind of a view, an extension of his almost childlike way of seeing the world that so often colored many of his personal interactions. Whichever is the case, and it should be noted that these two views aren't exactly mutually exclusive, Einstein's first year in Zurich was as liberating an experience as his year in Eru had been, but for obviously different reasons. He was now on his own and can follow his own whims to wherever they might take him. One might imagine that these include various rounds of dating, though we have no such record of any kind of activity outside of one relationship that was slow to develop beyond acquaintanceship, that slowly growing interest in Maleva Maric. Maric was the daughter of a well-to-do Serbian couple, Milos and Maria. Milos had served in the army of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, of which Serbia was a part at the time, had married into some wealth, and then had portrayed that into a profitable agricultural business that made it possible to provide a first-class education to his children. The oldest of these, born in 1875, four years before Albert, Maleva had shown an early aptitude for learning, especially in math and science. She added to this an almost religious fervor towards her studies that would earn her the nickname Saint. These strengths would result in her continuously earning the top grades at whatever school she attended and would propel her up the educational ladder, even opening doors usually barred to women. By the time she got to the university level, her family decided that Switzerland had a much more set, liberal set of attitudes towards women's education, and so she was sent to Zurich at the age of 21, first enrolling in the Polytechnique in October of 1896 as the only woman in the same program as Einstein. By all accounts, she was a somewhat severe woman, described by another female student as, quote, very smart and serious, small, delicate, brunette, ugly, end quote. She had a congenital hip defect that caused her to limp and was afflicted with latent tuberculosis and a tendency towards depression. However, what she may have lacked in physical beauty, at least in men's eyes, she made up in spirit. Like Einstein, she saw herself as a carefree bohemian who didn't think much of the wealthy and influential she had acted with, interacted with first in Novi Sad and then in Zagreb as she grew up. She was, as the saying goes, intense. Her spirit burned with a passion for mathematics and physics, and she was willing to step over whatever artificial boundaries were placed in her way, at least at first. This intensity, however, could be a negative, and it would, when times weren't good and things weren't going well, lead her into a brooding melancholy that would isolate her from what was going on around her and from those who cared most about her. One of the things I found most amazing about Maleva in my research was that after her first year at Zurich, she decided that it would be in her best interest to leave the Polytechnic for a semester or actually a full year to go to the University of Heidelberg to audit courses there. Now, she and Einstein had met as classmates during that previous year, as you probably expect, and over the summer break, he had invited her to go hiking with him in the Alps. The two had shared a pleasant enough vacation, 
plat completely platonic by all accounts, but it seems that she recognized that she had feelings for this dashing young man about town, and so decided that she actually needed to take a break from him. Nevertheless, while she was in Heidelberg, the two friends began a correspondence that actually survives down to us today, though it was lost to history for a period of time. In the first letter we have from her to him, we see a very different woman than the flighty and domestic Marie Wintler. What we actually see is a woman who is independent, witty, and willing to poke a good bit of fun at her friend. In the letter she writes, quote, It's now been quite a while since I received your letter, and I would have replied immediately and thank you for the sacrifice of writing four long pages. Would have told you also of the joy you provided me through our trip together. But you said I should write you some day when I happened to be bored. And I am very obedient, and I waited, and I waited, for boredom to set in. But so far, my waiting has been in vain." End quote. Later in the letter, she continued in the same vein, quote, Papa gave me some tobacco to take with me, and I was supposed to hand it to you personally. He wanted so much to whet your appetite for our little land of outlaws, meaning of course Serbia. I told him all about you. You must absolutely come back with me some day. The two of you would really have a lot to talk about. She, however, didn't include the tobacco with the letter, instead keeping it for herself and telling Einstein, quote, You would only have to pay duty on it, and then you would curse me, end quote. However, the letter wasn't all banter. The larger portion of it contained an account of the lectures on kinetic theory being given by Philip Lennard. While her description of the content showed that she did not possess a strong grasp of the subject matter, hardly surprising for a college sophomore, it does show that she was willing to push outside of her comfort zone to encounter new ideas and look into things that she wasn't entirely familiar with. It is this, most likely, more than anything, that attracted Einstein to her. This was not an infatuation, but rather a meeting of the minds, and to a degree spirits, that drew the two of them together. Over their course of, the co of their correspondence during that year, they seem to have fallen in love, or at least in terms of this kind of a thing, a very serious attraction. By February of 1898, Einstein was urging Maleva to return to Zurich, something she eventually decided to do, taking an apartment a few blocks from his. Not long after that, they were more or less a couple. But this wasn't your typical kind of college romance. In keeping with their bohemian sensibilities, the two spent as much time discussing the ideas they were learning as they did anything else. They saw themselves as intellectuals who were above and apart from the normal concerns of the world around them. They lived in shabby little apartments, drank bad coffee, smoked cheap tobacco, and sm studied physics and mathematics together. They sneered at the norms and expectations of society in the way only those whose wealthy relatives are paying the bills can. In time, this relationship became as intimate physically as it had intellectually. In one letter to her, Einstein wrote, quote, We understand each other's dark souls so well, and also drinking coffee and eating sausages, etc. End quote. And in another, quote, Best wishes, etc. Especially the latter. End quote. There could be no question what he meant in the etc., so impishly included. By 1899, the two were a proper bohemian couple, if such a term can be used. In their letters to each other, the formal German article of address, say, had been replaced by the more familiar do, and they had begun using pet names for each other. She was his little rascal, Dolly, and he was her wicked little sweetheart, Johnny. However, as is Often the case, with young adults still learning the ways of companionship, there were rough patches where Einstein's lack of sensitivity and March's melancholic and jealous nature tended to clash with predictable effects. On more than one occasion, he would write her letters that were breathtakingly harsh in relaying either his or others' thoughts regarding her. He likely felt that he was just being honest, but a more mature person would have found better ways to express themselves that spared the other party the uncertainty and an indignity the words certainly created. One such letter discusses a trip Einstein planned to take to Eru to visit the Wintler family and his old school during that summer of 1899. 
Marie would likely be there, and Einstein wrote, trying to reassure Mar Maleva, quote, I won't be going to Eru as often now that the daughter I was so madly in love with four years ago is coming back home. For the most part, I feel quite secure in my high fortress of calm, but I know that if I saw her a few more times, I would certainly go mad. Of that I am certain, and I fear it like fire, end quote. Not exactly confidence-inspiring words from a lover, especially when you tend to be insecure about your looks and just a bit jealous. The bigger issue would come up later, however, and it was when Einstein announced the true extent of their relationship to his parents in the summer following his graduation. His mother, who maintained a close relationship with the Winteler family, had never really given up hope that once Einstein finished school, he might be able to return to the family and rekindle that relationship with Marie. When she found out that Einstein had taken up with Maleva, she was nearly hysterical, lamenting that her son would never find a proper wife. As might be expected, this reaction only pushed the two lovers closer together, even in spite of the fact that Albert wrote to Maleva to describe, in somewhat painful detail, the litany of objections his mother had leveled against the relationship, most of which specifically had to do with his girlfriend's looks, her personality, her age, and any number of other perceived shortcomings. While the scandal of their love for each other would, in some ways, stoke their feelings for each other, it is clear that any long-term arrangement would be difficult without his parents' blessings. As I've mentioned in passing on a couple of occasions, Einstein graduated at the end of the spring of 1900. While his examination grades were the best among the five that remained in his class, his thesis project was viewed as being just barely acceptable. He had originally planned to attempt to create a way to measure the speed of the ether, the substance through which those light waves traveled. However, in a pattern that would mark much of his later work, he failed to really dig into the previous literature, and so was unaware that a number of others, most notably Mickelson and Morley in the United States, had already attempted to do this and had failed. Weber rejected the idea as well as one that would have attempted to relate electrical and thermal conductions through a use of electron theory, a somewhat cutting-edge idea at the time. Instead, Einstein and Marich were forced to focus on only heat conduction as that was Weber's area of specialization at that time. Frustrated by what they saw as unwarranted obstinance by Weber, a man they barely regarded at this point, they turned in work that, you know, just barely met the standards, or in Marich's case, didn't really meet the standards. For Einstein, his exam grades were good enough to bring up his overall final assessment to a passing level, but such was not the case for Maleva. She was denied a degree and was told to try again in a year. Unfortunately, due to events unforeseen to the two lovers, she would never pass her final exams and would thus be denied the degree she had so long dreamed of. As we bring this episode to a conclusion, I'd like to take a brief digression and talk a bit about Maleva Marich as a student and a scientist and contrast her with a contemporary who also had to overcome a number of barriers to achieve a career in physics, Maria Sklodowska, later Marie Curie. Sklodowska struggled with many of the same issues that would plague Marich, things like depression and heartbreak. But in Paris, she would earn first her bachelor's degree and eventually her PhD. While these were both goals that Maleva aspired to as well, she would fall short on both accounts. So how do we explain this? One possibility is that Curie was just a better scientist than Marich was, whether that be on the basis of talent or hard work. However, Marich's high marks during her schooling prior to Zurich tend to undermine this argument. Indeed, Maleva's willingness to travel to Heidelberg to further enhance her education point to a willingness to go further than most of her classmates to be successful. When one looks at the lives of the two women, I think what stands out, at least for me, is the amount of support they each had 
either from family or from the communities they lived in. Sklodowska came from a family of high-achieving intellectuals in Poland and was for a time romantically attached to the son of another family with similar intellectual backgrounds. In fact, he would be one that would go on to earn a PhD in mathematics. When she fled Poland for Paris, she was encouraged to continue her studies by the emigre community there. In time, she would be sponsored by Henri Becquerel in her research on radioactivity. And her eventual husband would set aside his research into piezoelectricity to work on her projects, helping her to complete them successfully. None of this is said to diminish Marie's work and contributions, but rather to recognize that she was able to accomplish them in an environment of support. Maleva's experience upon entering Zurich Polytechnique on the other hand, couldn't have been much more different. Unlike Marie, she was generally isolated from any real support system. Her family didn't know or understand academic life, and so couldn't be much of a source of encouragement. Her personality was that of being something of a loner, a tendency that was encouraged by her relationship with Albert. She seems to have had no significant scientific sponsorship or mentoring, especially once Einstein ran afoul of the physics faculty. Unlike the case with Pierre, who included Marie within the scientific community he was a part of, Maleva's relationship with Einstein would have served to cut her off from the few people who could have provided support other than Marcel Grossman. Most telling, however, was Einstein's role in what transpired in the year following her failure to pass the exams. Rather than setting aside his own goals, at least in part to help his partner achieve her ambitions, he moved on to other things, only relating to her in terms of how she fit into his life. While I don't think that I can say with any certainty that Maleva would have been successful in Zurich had she had more support, as she might have chosen a similar path regardless of what resources might have been there to help her, it's hard not to imagine what might have been the case had she been in Maria Skl Skladowska's position. I say this is both a historical what-if, but also because, as I write and record this, it is International Girls and Women's in Science Day, as declared by the United Nations. Here in the U.S. and throughout the world, there are girls and women who aspire to scientific careers who face any number of obstacles, ranging from a simple lack of support to outright hostilities that men just don't encounter. If you are a woman listening to this podcast, I hope that you will be able to work to overcome those societal and institutional obstacles that come up. And that would maybe include not getting romantically involved with self-centered men, no matter how brilliant they might be. For the guys out there, I hope that you'll work to recognize that the women around you are your colleagues just as, with just as much talent and drive as you have. See them as equals and do not erect additional barriers they have to overcome. And for goodness sakes, do not view them as objects for your personal gratification or as some sort of lesser vessel that is incapable to doing the real work in your discipline. While the Me Too movement has captured the headlines in relation to politics and entertainment, every single woman that I know of in the areas of STEM has a story of sexual harassment that they can tell. And I do mean every single one. Let's do better. Finally, for parents, encourage your daughters. Find them role models and introduce them to them. Seek out women who have been successful in STEM fields and disciplines and join the communities of support. It is my dream that in time we'll have just as many stories of women like Marie Sklodowska Curie or Vera Rubin as we do of men like Arthur Eddington and Albert Einstein. And, even more than that, that narratives like that of Maleva Marich will become a rarity. On a much brighter note, this week's shout-out goes to the men and women of SpaceX on their successful test launch of the Falcon Heavy rocket, along with the cargo of the aforementioned Elon Musk's Tesla Roadster. The car, firmly attached as it is to the second stage module of the Falcon Heavy, is now in a transfer orbit that will take it into the region of the asteroid belt, not too far from the orbit of the minor planet Ceres, before swinging back into the inner solar system. Space flight is hard to do, as we said before, and SpaceX has overcome its share of setbacks to reach this point. <laughs> 
I have to say that the images of the two Falcon 9 boosters returning to the Kennedy Space Flight Center and landing side by side was about the coolest thing I've seen in a while. If you haven't had a chance to watch the launch, you can head over to the SpaceX website and watch the entire thing. And as a side note, I've given my physics classes an extra credit assignment to take the telemetry data from the launch and use it to plot graphs of the rocket's position, velocity, and acceleration versus time graphs in order to tie what we've been doing this year to a real-world example of motion. It'll be interesting to see what they come up with. And if any of you want to try that, you're more than welcome to. Post your results at our Facebook page or just email them to me at c davies at mac.com and I'll put them up on our website. Next week on the Scientific Odyssey, we'll look at Albert and Maleva's next several years in Zurich in order to better understand the factors that led to the miracle year of 1905. Until then, full sails on your journey.